Right. Hello, everyone. We'll get started for today. Um, so quickly, I made a couple changes. Um, I moved the shader out of the render. Render no longer um, contain contains a shader itself. You just pass it in as part of the draw function. Um, I was working on our like dynamic rendering pipeline, um, which we'll do later on. And it's like this is how we end up doing it. So I figured I'd just um, start it out this way instead of leaving it as it was and then having to come back and change a bunch of stuff. Um, also, I just added this um, core file in our source folder here and put it in this namespace engine, which we haven't started on yet. Um, but I just moved some of these constants out um, that we were using in our index buffer previously. Um, like we had them stored as private static variables of this class, which is not good because uh, our graphics library should be as general purpose as possible. Um, and so restricting it to just drawing quads is not good. So instead now you specify how many indices there are per primitive, how many vertices there are per primitive, uh, and then you give an array of offset values that is then used to generate the actual buffer. Um, so just some simple housekeeping stuff, uh, no new functionality or anything. Um, the font size. I will do that, yes. So today we are going to work on textures. Um, so I think we'll just jump right into it. I don't have much else to say. Textures are just, uh, I talked about this last time, but textures are just images on the, you know, on disk um, that we want to load into our game um, so that we don't have to draw everything with these weird like colors. Uh, so I have class texture here. Go ahead and include it in my all.h. Um, I'll include it above render. Um, because we will be using texture, like we'll be passing textures to one of our render functions. So I'll go ahead and put it there. Um, so this is going to be sort of a, like I'm going to teach this a bit differently than I did the previous stuff, because um, textures are sort of similar to all the other stuff we've done so far, like vertex buffers, um, vertex arrays, and that they have an ID, um, like OpenGL associates them with an ID. Um, and previously, I, I, what I've been doing is like showing you the raw OpenGL code, and then we sort of take it and put it in a class. Um, but I don't know, I, I figure like you guys have enough experience at this point that I can just go ahead and start writing the actual class. No need to spend time. Um, showing you anything. And at this point, like, we have so much stuff written that everything is like, uh, oh, I'll leave that out for now. Everything is already sort of compartmentalized anyways, so there's not really a point to planning it all out. It's already done. Um, okay, so we have a texture, which is a GL object, and we will assign to our uh, MID field with GL gen textures. Just want to create one, uh, and then we will immediately bind it. Um, so textures are a bit weird in that, um, I guess they're not that weird. They're, they're sort of similar to vertex buffers in that um, before you use them, you need to set some parameters. So like for vertex buffers, that comes in the form of describing them uh, in our vertex array class here with the vertex attrib pointer. Um, but with textures, we just sort of set parameters um, on the texture object directly. So we do that with GL text parameter I. Um, our um, the target is GL texture two D. Um, that might be a con bit confusing, actually. Let, let's go ahead and write the bind method just so that doesn't look weird. Um, I'll comment that out for now. Um, so this is a GL object, so we have to override bind and unbind. And we use the function GL bind texture. The target is GL texture 2D. Uh, you can see there are a bunch of different types here, um, and we'll look at another one shortly. 
Um, now our bind method is going to work a bit differently um, from our other ones. Um, it, it has sort of a new architecture, I suppose, um, compared to what we've seen before in terms of binding. Um, so the way GPU textures work is um, unlike a vertex buffer um, or a vertex array where you just bind to this like, well, vertex array is not a good example because it has its own function. But if we look at our buffer class, the bind here, um, we do GL bind buffer and then specify a target. And that target will be GL array buffer for vertex buffers, GL element array buffer for index buffers, and there are some more. Um, but the point is that there's only you can only bind one thing to each of those targets. Textures um, have a bunch of different targets. And these are specified by GL texture starting at zero. Um, and then they go, I don't know how far they go. 31 maybe? Yeah, I think 31. So like 32 texture slots is the maximum supported by any hardware um, right now. And so you have these macro definitions here, GL texture 0, 1, dot, 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 all the way to 31. Um, and something we'll notice about these is, um, that can just make it easier to write this code, is the first one is OX84C0. So that's GL texture zero, and then GL texture one is OX84C1, um, and they are concurrent values until you get to 31. Um, now, these are technically different targets. You, you can bind a unique texture object um, to each of these targets, uh, but they're they're all of the same type. You have to bind a texture to them. Um, and the reason we do this. I don't think I'm going to touch on today. Basically, just know it's for efficiency. Because um, if you have multiple textures bound at the same time, you can issue draw calls that use multiple textures at the same time and, and save on like overhead. Um, so we do have to override this sort of basic bind function here, because it's part of our geo object. Um, but we, we also want to specify a slot um, to bind our texture to, because we have you know up to 32 texture slots. Um, and so we don't just want to use one of those. We want to be able to use all. Uh, so the way you sort of set a texture to a slot is GL active texture. Um, and then you use these macros. So starting at GL texture 0, and then because those values are consecutive, we can just add this uint to them. So if slot is 0, then this will be geo texture zero if slot is one it'll be geo texture one and so on um, and really you might want to do some error checking in here to make sure that um, the result value of this is you know not greater than gl texture 31 which is the maximum uh, or even better would be to make sure it's not greater than the number of textures that your hardware can support um, which we will look at uh, so once you've set that texture slot as active um, we have this gl bind texture function which is very similar to our other stuff. Um, so this is what I was talking about, about how it's like sort of a weird mix between the previous bind syntax, where you do have like this one target in quotes that you're binding to. Um, but for, for textures in particular, this GL texture 2D slot um, can have multiple sort of sub slots, I guess. And, and this GL active texture specifies which sub slot you're currently operating on uh, within this point. Um, so that's good. And then this, this bind, this uh, void override one we have to do, um, we're not really going to use it, but we do have to like define it. We, we have to, because it, it's pure virtual in GL object, so we have to give it um, a function body. So I'll just set it to bind to zero, um, but really we're never going to use that. Um, okay, so that's all the rest of the stuff. Now we can go back to the constructor here. So we have GL text parameter i. Um, and within our texture constructor, we can we can just use this default bind method to zero because it doesn't matter where we've bound here. We're not like we're not setting up state to issue a draw call here. We're just trying to bind it to anywhere so that we can modify it. So we're operating on GeoTexture 2D, um, and then there are four parameters that we have to set. 
The first is GL Texture Min Filter, which I'll set to GL Linear. I'll just copy that line. The next is GL, uh, not Max, Mag Filter. And I'll talk about each of these in a minute. Then I'll just copy that line two more times. GL Texture Wrap S. And I'll set that to GL Clamp. And we have Texture Wrap T, which is also going to be GL Clamp. Um, OK, so I'll explain a bit about these. We'll look at them more in a minute. But um, min filter, um, this GL linear thing, it, it, it specifies the function that OpenGL uses to I guess render or, or determine how to like resize your texture if the area you're resizing into is smaller than the base texture. Um, and mag filter works much the same way where it uses this function if you're resizing into an area that's bigger than the actual texture. Um, and then texture wrap T and S, um, we're not going to be doing anything with those, but they just like, um, they specify how tiling works. Um, so I, I think, and probably don't quote me on this because I might be wrong. I've never actually like investigated it, I don't think. But I'm pretty sure what they do is like if you have um, an area that you're rendering to that's bigger than the texture, if you set this to a certain value, it'll actually like tile the texture across that, like in multiples of the actual physical texture size. Um, but I don't know. E either way, we're just going to set GL clamp, and that'll make sure that um, we don't get any weird tiling or anything. It just resizes our texture to fill whichever area we've defined. OK, and then once we do that, um, we've taken in some parameters here. I didn't talk about these. So uchar data, this is a, an array of unsigned chars, which is just 8-bit ints. Um, this will be, in our case, this will be um, like consecutive values of R, G, and B. So data at 0 will be a red value, data at 1 will be a green value, and data at 2 will be a blue value, and then continue like that forever. Um, now, there are other ways you could do this. Like, you could have a fourth value in there for alpha um, if, if you wanted to, you know, if, if you had some image format that supported that. Um, for what we're doing, we're only going to be using bitmaps um, just because those are uncompressed or, well, uh, I guess that's a right way to say it, but like PNGs and JPEGs, they, they undergo this compression process, um, and to extract the data out of them, you have to decompress them, and for that, you basically need a library. Um, so we're just going to be using bitmaps, because um, it is simple, but at the same time, it sort of gets us a little bit of experience with, you know, loading from files, which I think is valuable. Um, so yeah, for, for our purposes, data will always be in just RGB pairs consecutively. But we will eventually set the option for the user to specify that themselves, because we want our library to be as general purpose as possible. So once we've set those parameters, uh, we can actually upload our data array to the texture. So the target, of course, is GL Texture 2D. The int level is 0. Uh, we're going to come back and change this, so I'm just going to sort of breeze through it for now. Um, the internal format. Um, is going to be GL RGBA8. The width is going to be uh, the width that we've been given in the constructor, the height, same thing. Um, for border, we're going to set that to zero. Format will be GL RGBA with no eight at the end. Type will be GL unsigned byte. That's the type of our array. And then we actually give it the pointer. So when we do this, um, I've, I've, I've said, I know I just said what we're going to do is like um, RGB stuff, but I've set it to RGBA just so we can see the um, alpha blending stuff just while we're testing it. Um, but our bitmap, bitmaps do not store opacity values. It's only RGB. Um, so yeah, that's all I'm going to do for now. Um, I'll come back and explain more later. Um, now, real quickly, in our graphics core file here, uh, we're going to write another function way down at the bottom um, to get max texture units. 
So this is what I was talking about. Like you might want to check in your texture bind thing here that the GL texture zero plus slot is not greater than the max texture units you have. Um, so the way we do this is kind of annoying. It's like the OpenGL syntax where you have to receive, like it doesn't return a value. You have to pass it a pointer and it'll do that. It'll put the value in there. Um, but the thing we want is GL max texture image units. Um, make sure that is image units. Uh, there is another one called GL max texture units. I'm not sure what that is, but um, when I was starting this project and like trying to make everything work between Mac and Windows, I had GL texture units on Windows and it was working fine. And then I had GL I had the same thing, GL max texture units on Mac, and it wasn't working. And this was the reason. You need GL max texture image units. So I'm not sure what the other one is, but don't don't care. We need this one. And then we'll just return the result. Um, and weirdly, this is an integer, but I don't think it'll ever be negative. Um, yeah. Okay. So now we'll look at um, our shader. We're going to alter this a bit. Um, yeah, I think why don't I, I think I'll just go ahead and copy this. Um, I'll make a new shader file um, just in case we want to come back to this one earlier or later. So I'll call this shader underscore texture dot glsl, and I'll just copy what I have in my basic shader in there, just exactly. Um, so we need some more information as part of each vertex now. Um, so when we're using textures, we're not going to store color data in our vertices. Uh, like you could, uh, if you wanted to like blend your texture color with some arbitrary color in the vertex data, but I don't know, that's weird. We're not going to do that. So we're going to replace this vec2 color here um, with a texture coordinate. Um, and what this is, is it's a vec2, uh, so x and y. Uh, and the values are normalized, truly normalized, between 0 and 1, um, where 0, 0 is the bottom left of the texture, and 1, 1 is the top right. Um, and as I've talked about before, um, OpenGL, when you output variables from the vertex shader and they go into the fragment shader, because the fragment shader runs many, many, many times for each you know, set of vertex shader calls, um, OpenGL will interpolate those output values for you. Um, and so in our vertex data, we'll sort of specify, um, like you can see here, our vertices are bottom left, bottom right, top right, top left. So all we have to do is specify the extremes of the texture coordinates, and then OpenGL will handle the rest for us, and each individual, each individual pixel will end up with the correct value. Um, and then the last thing we're going to do is add another float, which is the texture index. Um, so this is what's going to be used uh, with our it sort of lines up with this bind function here. Whichever slot we set a texture to, um, that's what our texture index is going to be. And we'll look at that in the, in the uh, fragment shader. Um, OK, so now I'll just edit this a bit. Um, we'll have, we just need to pass these two components to the fragment shader, basically. We're not doing anything with them in the vertex shader. Uh, so we have an out vec2 v text chord and an out float the text index and then just copy the values in there like that then of course we need to receive those values in our fragment shader okay um, now, we do need one more component in our fragment shader, and this component is a uniform. Uh, the type is going to be sampler2d. Now, this is a very strange <laughs> data structure. Um, I'm not really sure what it is, like, under the hood. I I'm sure it's just some type of, like, array of pointers, basically. Um, but basically, if you look at the actual documentation on it, um, it doesn't even explain it. It just says, like, don't worry about it. Uh, you just need to use it for textures. 
And so, okay, like we have to use this, but all we're going to upload to this, because um, remember uniforms, uh, we have to set um, like individually with these set uniform functions. Um, all we're going to upload is an array of integers. Um, so kind of weird. I, I don't, I don't really know why it needs to exist, um, but it does. So once we have this, um, we are, so we're in our fragment shader. So each pixel, we have a texture coordinate, which tells us where we need to sample from our texture. And we have a texture index, which tells us which texture in this sampler 2D array um, we need to sample from. Um, and, and I've just sort of hard coded this um, size of 32 on there because that is the maximum size. Um, and it's, it's the size that my graphics card supports. Um, if yours supports smaller, I don't think this will cause any problems. Um, it might. So if that's the case, all you have to do is um, change this 32 to like whatever the output of your call to get max texture units is. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think that should cause any problems, but it's probably platform dependent. Um, OK, so we have this built in function here called texture. Um, and the first thing we do is pass it an actual well, it's not a texture. It's a it's a sampler 2D, whatever that is. Um, but we just get it from our uTextures uniform array there. Um, and we use our text index. Uh, our text index is a float. So we'll go ahead and convert that to an int just because it won't like trying to get something from an array at a float index. Um, and then all we have to do is pass it our text chord. So this just says, get me the color, uh, which it, it is a vec for, um, of from this texture at this text coordinate. And that's all you have to do. So it's going to be a little while before we can test this. Um, there is some setup required with textures. Um, so once you've gotten your shader texture all filled out, We'll go ahead and move over to the render. Um, and here we're just going to write another sort of temporary draw function um, that takes in a texture. So it's going to take in a render object, just like before. Now it's also going to take in a texture, just a single texture, and of course a shader. So we are going to do object.bind, then texture.bind, um, and we can just call the default bind function here um, because we're only doing one. Um, eventually, we'll have a draw function that takes in an array of textures, and we'll need to loop through that array and bind each, each of the textures within that array to a unique index. But for now, we're just doing one. Um, then we'll bind our shader, the shader.bind. And then I'll just copy and paste this, the same GL draw elements call from up there. And why is this yelling at me? Is inaccessible. Hmm. Oh, I forgot to do public at the top of my texture class. Um, in C++, every member in a class is private by default. Um, so if you don't specify public, you won't be able to access any of it. OK, that should have fixed that. Very nice. Um, okay, so now we have everything we need to draw a texture. We have a shader set up for it. Um, we have our render function set up to bind the texture and draw it. Um, so now we just need to edit our vertex data and actually create some texture data. Um, and like I said, eventually we'll be loading um, from files. But for now, just for like testing this functionality, we will generate some texture data within our code, uh, which is kind of interesting, but not particularly useful. OK, so the first step here, um, I, I think I'll edit the vertices first, um, just because that'll make it, I, I don't want to forget about that later. Um, so right now we have these RG, like just sort of arbitrary RGB values at the end of each vertex. Uh, uh, Texture.h, just make sure it's above render.h. Um, and you don't need to do it that way. You If, if you want to do it wherever, you can just do include texture.h, and it'll do that fine. But um, I'm trying to keep this library like very clean. It's a header-only library, very easy to use. Uh, but yeah, just, just make sure your texture is included before your render or within your render. Uh, OK, so our bottom left, uh, remember looking at our shader real quick. I'll split this off. Um, we have eye position, 
which has remained the same. We're not changing that. And we have itext chord and itext index. So we still have three values, but they're different. So the text index or the text chord for the bottom left, um, as I said, is zero zero. And then the texture index for this, um, eventually we will be changing this and sort of setting it like dynamically. Um, but for now, just because we're using one texture, all we need to do is set that to zero, and that'll be fine. The bottom right is going to be one in the x, still zero in the y. The top right is going to be one in the x and one in the y. And then the top left is going to be zero in the x and one in the y. Remember, all of them have the zero texture index. OK, so that's all we needed to do there. Um, now we will actually generate our textures. Um, I'm actually, I'm going to do this down here. We need to do it after our shader is created, because we have to set some uniforms in our shader. So I'll get the texture units that our hardware supports. Um, and then just for curiosity's sake, I'll go ahead and print that out. As I've said, mine is 32. Yours may be different. Um, and we'll go ahead and print this out just to see if um, if any of you have lower than 32, if that causes issues with our sort of 32 value in our shader here. Once we have that, um, we will create a new integer array. Uh, and like I said, this part is really weird. I don't understand what's going on. Like, I mean, I understand what's going on. It's just, it doesn't really make sense. Um, but this is just how like the sampler 2D data type works um, in GLSL. So all we need to do here is create an array of ints, the length of like the maximum number of texture units that our hardware supports, and then set each the value at each index equal to that index. So zero will be zero, one will be one, and so on. Um, my best guess as to what this does is um, like there's not inherently a link between um, <clears throat> like a sampler 2D array in GLSL and these GL texture zero, like the slot you've bound it to. And so this is what that does. I, and again, this is just a guess. Um, is it, it says, okay, my sampler 2D, um, that's just gonna be like, it'll have whatever data in there by default, but really I want the zero with texture to point to um, GL active texture slot zero. Um, and then so on until 32 or whatever. I think that's what it does. Uh, so once we have that, uh, we will call this method set uniform one IV on our shader, which we haven't defined yet. We'll have to do that real quick. Um, the name is U textures, um, and, and you can see really that under the hood, this is uh, one IV means. Uh, I'm not really sure what the one is. I guess the number of elements per group or something. But i is integer and v is vector. So it's just like um, a, a an array of ints of arbitrary length. Um, so that's what this sampler 2D array is. Like it's literally just ints with a special type. Um, and then we will send uh, the number. The length of our array is texture units. And the data we're sending is samplers. And then, of course, once we're done with samplers, uh, we'll delete it. Um, so the, the reason that we have to do this sort of dynamically and that get max texture units is like a method that you have to call. It's like a result of this get integer v thing. It's not a constant. Um, is because this code will be compiled on some arbitrary hardware and then run on additional, like potentially different other arbitrary hard hardware. Um, and so this this value may be different. You you don't want to hard code the number of max texture image units into the program um, so that it only works with whatever system you compiled it on, um, which it is kind of annoying, but like uh, there's not a way around it. Um, and so that's why we have to make this a method and sort of do all this stuff dynamically. Um, but whatever, it's not that big a deal. Um, okay, so now let's actually write this set uniform one IV method in our shader. Um, this will be very simple. Um, because we did all that work last time. So set uniform one IV. Of course, we take in the name. Uh, then we take in a uint length. And then a pointer to the data. 
All we have to do is call set uniform on GL uniform one IV with our uh, given name, length, and our data, just like that. And the compiler will work it all out and generate a function for us that matches this description. Very nice. Okay, so that's sort of the, the basic groundwork done for like even getting this shader working. Um, but now we have to send it a texture. Um, so let's generate that. I'm going to define some constants here uh, just for now. Again, this is sort of a weird approach, just generating texture data within our code on the fly, just to test this system out. Um, so what I have here, data width and data height are like the number of pixels in the X and Y axes that our texture will be. Um, and then data size is going to be the total number of bytes required by that. So obviously the area of a rectangle is width times height. And then there are four bytes per pixel. Because um, for this example, we're doing RGBA. So four bytes per pixel. Now we have our actual data array, which is just U chars. Um, now we should do this like this. So this is sort of neat C++ syntax. Um, I don't think it works for any other value. Maybe it does. I don't know. Um, but if you have an array, like a statically allocated array of any size, and you give it this initializer list with only one value, it'll set every element in the list to that value. So we'll just initialize everything to all zeros, just so there's no weird side effects. Um, OK, so now um, I think we'll start out just doing a very boring texture. We'll just make it like all red or something. Because um, again, this is just sort of an example, and there's not really need a need to get um, that fancy with it. But I think just like once we verify that it's working, I think just to like show you how textures can be different from the regular primitives that we were drawing, um, I'll actually spice this up a bit. Um, but for now, we'll just set, um, so we have everything to zero. Um, and we want to set it to all red. OK, so first thing to do is remember the order. Our, our, our thing is just an array of uchars, but those are in a specific order. So we have red, then green, then blue, then alpha. So we're only interested in red and alpha. So those will be at indices i times 4 plus zero, that's what red is, because um, they're groups of four, and we're looping through every pixel here. So every pixel is four uchars. So that's going to be red. And this is a uchar. So it's going to be, uh, I think eventually the GPU probably converts it to a float, um, but we'll just set it to all the way red. So that's going to be the maximum value for an unsigned char, which is 255. Um, and then the next one we're interested in, we don't care about green or blue. We just want alpha, which is going to be i times 4 plus 3. And we will also set that all the way on. So no transparency. OK, so once we have our basic data array there, we can create a texture, uh, which takes, what does it take? It takes data, so the array of data, the width of the texture, the height of the texture, um, and for now, that's it. We just have these sort of hard-coded like parameter values, um, which we'll change in a minute. Um, OK, so we have that. So we set our samplers, set up our shader, set up our texture. Um, we already changed our vertex data to match. Um, so now, if we call our render.draw function here, and we send our texture there in the middle, uh, we should get a red rectangle. Ooh, not quite. Oh, <laughs> we did everything right except tell it to use the right shader. Um, yeah, here we go. We're still using shader.glsl. We want to be using shader underscore texture.glsl. Um, but that, that was actually interesting. So you can see here, um, I, I'll go back to this just for a minute. Um, like, we're not getting any weird... Resu well, we are getting weird results, but no weird geometry. Like, this is the correct shape. Um, and the reason for this is that our, our texture shader and our default shader, the color one we were using, have essentially, I, I mean, it's obviously not to us the same vertex layout. 
um, but it's the same number of elements per vertex. We have a vec2 and then a vec3, which is just three floats. And here we have a vec2, a vec2, and then a float. Um, so that's why that was like working and not like totally spazzing out very weird. Um, but we do actually, now that we're using this sort of different grouping of 2, 2, 1 instead of 2, 3, in our render object here, we'll change that 2, comma, 3 to 2, comma, 2, comma, 1. Um, because we're grouping this into x, y, s, t, and then i. And there we go. And then, of course, make sure we are using the correct shader here. Uh, and then I, I'm just going to ignore the camera for now. I don't, I don't want to. I don't want anything moving around. And there we go. We get this red rectangle. Um, it looks a bit weird. Um, and yours might look slightly different, uh, depending on, like, you might have certain, uh, like, override settings set in your graphics drivers that could affect how this looks. Um, but basically, just notice that it's different from our previous one, where our previous one was, like, very sharp, and everything, like, every pixel was, like, a full color. This one, like, at the edges, it's sort of this weird, like, mushy rounding effect, and then, like, eventually a hard cutoff. Um, so what this is, is a result of the parameters we've set for our texture. So we have um, texture mag filter, which is set to geolinear, um, and that's, that's what's being used here. Because remember, our texture data is only 16 pixels by 16 pixels. And obviously, this is much bigger than that. So it, it's it's using this sort of linear blending to fit the texture into this bigger area, um, which I think is horrendously ugly. Like, I don't think you should ever basically use linear blending for a 2D game. Uh, there's just, I don't know, like 3D stuff, it, it works all right just because the, the level of detail is like so much greater than in a 2D game that all of that sort of fuzziness, like, it just gets lost um, to the viewer. So it doesn't really matter that much. Um, but yeah, for 2D games, like linear blending, uh, I don't know. I, I don't see any reason to use that. Um, so instead, what we'll do is we will um, set this to a different value, which is GL nearest. And what this does is for each pixel, remember this is for when our, our resulting area is either smaller than our real texture or greater than our real texture. So for each pixel, rather than like interpolating, uh, like sort of mapping the position of that pixel within the resulting image onto the dimensions of the actual texture data and then doing some interpolation there, it, it essentially does like an integer division and modulo operation, um, where it, it treats the texture data as, as what it is really, which is an, a, an array of bytes. Um, and it just gets the X, Y coordinate of the, like the X, X, Y coordinate closest to the pixel that's being drawn and gets the color directly rather than doing any blending. So if we run this now, um, it should look much better. Like, obviously it's still boring and it's not really a texture, it's just a color, but like, it doesn't have that ugly fuzziness near the edges. It's very sharp, very clean. Um, so this is something that, as I said, for 2D games, like I don't see a reason not to use GL nearest, um, but as like graphics library architects here, I guess, we, we should realize that um, some people might like that. And also maybe eventually, uh, this won't just be a 2D graphics library. It, it could be used for 3D as well. Um, so we'll actually take all of these sort of values that we've hard-coded here and put them in this struct texture options, uh, which will just contain a bunch of default values for all of these. So we'll have GL, the will be GL enums, uh, min for the min filter. Um, I'll set that to linear by default even though I think it's awful. Um, S is going to be GL clamp. Uh, and once again, I'm not messing with that. Um, you can do some investigation on your own to see, like, uh, just messing around with those and see what you get. But I've never had to use them. Uh, format will set to GL RGBA. Uh, that's sort of a good default, because 
I don't know, like, even if you're using bitmaps, um, and this might be what we're doing actually, like even though we're just reading RGB data from bitmaps, it's not uncommon to just sort of extend that with alpha data um, and just set every pixel alpha full, just give it no transparency because ultimately like alpha is useful and everything should have an alpha value. So this is sort of a common step at which to assign that if, if, if an alpha value doesn't exist in whatever format. So we'll just set the default to having alpha, but our user can change that if they want. Uh, now the internal format um, is, we're not gonna talk about, but it, note that it is RGBA8 instead of RGBA. Um, and these two are different. Um, I can't even remember which one is which, um, but I know that one of them has to do with the format of this data pointer you give it, and the other has to do with the format that OpenGL uses to store the texture. Um, and then the type, of course, will be GL unsigned byte. Um, but we'll leave that as a parameter because uh, it, it is possible and not uncommon these days actually to give um, like float pixel data, um, which is uh, has a much wider range of values than uchars, obviously. Um, now, just a little bit on that um, like internal format thing. Um, I'll sort of give you this reference. Docs.gl is what I use like all the time when I'm writing OpenGL code. Um, it's a very clean like interface for documentation and you, you can just Google or not Google, but search for whichever function you're using. So we're looking at um, GL text image 2D um, and you can see it comes up with everything that matches that. And then it has these other or all of these different um, versions. So ES3 and ES2, that's for OpenGL embedded systems, uh, like stuff that runs on your phone. So obviously we're not using that. Uh, we're not using uh, GL2 or 4. Um, we're using GL3.3 right now. Um, I, I don't think much changed like in existing functions between three and four, but just, just to be safe, just click on GL3. Um, and it gives you the function header as well as a description of all the parameters and even values that that parameter can take. So it's, it's very, very useful um, and it's a great resource. So if we look at um, like format and internal format, I'll, I'll just like keep going with this. I said I wasn't going to talk about it, but just quickly. So internal format specifies the number of color components in the texture. Okay, that's still kind of vague, but what is format? Format is the format of the pixel data. Okay. So yeah, that's what it is. The, the, this format value here, GLRGBA, um, controls how this array is interpreted. And the internal format, GLRGBA8, um, controls how OpenGL stores the texture. Um, so the names are actually pretty intuitive. They're just similar, so it's easy to mix them up. Um, okay, so now that we have that structure, uh, we'll just pa uh, pass in uh, an optional one as our last parameter here. Uh, and then just start going down the list, replacing these. Um, I have to name it, of course, options. So this will be options.min, options.mag, options.s, t. Uh, we're not going to change this deal texture 2D. Um, I'm not sure. I don't remember what the level is. We're not messing with that for now. RGBA8 is going to be our internal format. Uh, this zero, actually, if we go back to docs real quick, um, that actually must be zero. <laughs> it says border this value must be zero. So I guess it's just some legacy functionality that doesn't exist, but they left it in the function header to prevent code from breaking. Uh, I don't know, it's weird. Options.format and then options.type. Um, so if we, like now that we have all these default values plugged in, if, if we run it again, we'll get that same like ugly blending because we set linear interpolation as, as the default, um, which we don't want. So I'll just come into our texture here in our main file uh, and set dot min equal to gl nearest and dot mag equal to gl nearest. And that should give us what we had before. Perfect. Crisp. Um, okay, so we're gonna do something here that I'm 
I'm not sure if it's like a good practice to do in a graphics library. Um, it's not harmful, but it's probably best, I, I would guess, for some reasons. And I'm not knowledgeable enough to know what those reasons are. But I, I would assume that it's best to have like a, a texture class like this that just supports basic 2D textures. Um, but what we're going to do is um, we're not going to rewrite this, but we're, we're going to change it a little bit um, to instead of just supporting basic textures, we're going to support uh, texture 2D arrays. Um, which are cool because they are very similar to regular textures, but OpenGL separates them out into multiple sort of sub-textures for you. Um, and this is very useful to us because we're going to be doing like, you know, like like 2D animations. Um, and we don't want to have a separate texture on our graphics card and have to load a separate file for each frame of that animation. We just want a, a single image that's sort of drawn in a particular pattern and then have OpenGL use that pattern to split it into multiple textures for us. Basically, that's what we're doing. Um, so we'll rewrite this just a bit. Um, all of this texture option stuff is going to be exactly the same. Um, texture 2D arrays aren't that different. Um, the one difference we need, though, is we're going to have an additional parameter here called frames. So this is going to be the number of different textures that OpenGL will split our data array here into. Um, so we do the same thing, GL gen textures, we bind it. Um, the main thing we're going to change is GL texture 2D array. So that's going to be our target for everything. So I'll just copy that for all of these parameters here in the constructor. And then all of these, um, bi the bind and unbind down here. Um, now, interestingly, for 2D arrays, uh, you still use this GL texture 0 slot. Um, now, there, there are things like there's 1D textures you may have seen and 3D textures. I don't know what all those are, um, but I assume that this, this GL texture 0 through 31 slot is like the same for all of those. Um, that, would be, that would be my guess. So we don't actually have to change that. Um, so actually, I'm just going to comment. I'm going to delete that GL text image 2D because we're going to use a different function. Um, so yeah. Uh, None of this changes, which is nice. Um, and, and this is the reason I, I'm sort of doing this like all within this class rather than having another class called like texture array or something, which, you know, again, I, I think that's probably the more correct approach. Um, but just because it's so simple, I didn't want to copy paste a bunch of stuff. Um, we're just changing this very minimally. So all we have to do is change this function called the way we upload data, which is going to be text image 3D. The target of course, is going to be GL Texture 2D Array. Level is still going to be zero. Um, internal format we have in our options list. Width is the same. Height is the same. Depth, which is a new variable, we're just going to set to frames, which is this, this additional thing we've taken in through our constructor here. Um, border, of course, is going to be zero. And then we just set options.format options.type, and then our data. Um, so yeah, that's very similar to the 2D call we were doing. Um, just, uh, I think to me, this is like a, a good hint about how to think about these um, these th 3D tech, these 2D texture arrays, um, is that it's like a 3D texture. It's like, instead of having just a rectangle, you have a rectangular prism. And each like slice of that rectangular prism um, is a different frame because that's that's the depth value we gave it. So the, the number of pixels deep it is. Width and height are the number of pixels in the x and y axes. Frames is the number of pixels in the z axis. Um, and so this texture 2D array, you can think of it as a 3D sort of cuboid, um, which is, is kind of useful. Uh, but yeah, I, I think that's all we have to do um, in here. We might not even have to change this code uh, other than giving it a, a frames number to our constructor, uh, but we do have to change our shader just a little bit, um, just the fragment shader. Um, we have to use a different override of this texture function because um, this this basic like just two element one um, only works on regular 2D textures. So I'll go ahead and comment that out. Um, now we're going to also modify this. Instead of just a sampler 2D, we're using 2D arrays. We have sampler 2D array. 
Um, and then I, we're not going to do anything with this just yet, um, but I'll go ahead and write it because uh, we will need it soon, which is a uniform int array of texture frames. Um, so this is like an additional parameter that we need to send to this texture function now that we're using, in quotes, 3D textures, um, is the, the actual frame that each texture, the, the frame to be drawn from each texture in our array of sampler 2D arrays. So we can rewrite this as O color equals, uh, actually I'll go ahead and, we're gonna need that index multiple times. So I'll go ahead and create it up here. Just cast it to an int. So we have texture still doing on U textures at index, that hasn't changed. Um, but the, the parameter has changed because instead of this one, uh, where you specify the texture and then a VEC2, the text chord, uh, we actually give a VEC3 here, um, which intuitively is just our 2D texture coordinate and the frame that we want, which is going to be texture frames at index. Uh, one more parenthesis. There we go. And then we can delete this initial call here. Um, so now back in our, um, main file, um, I, again, I don't think you, like, you don't need to do this. I, you, I think you should though, is like officially initialize all of your uniform values. Um, so we'll go ahead and do that. Um, after we've set our textures array here, we'll just use, we'll just use that same array. Because uh, it, it needs to be of the same size, just the same texture units. And we'll set samplers at i equal to 0. We'll just clear the whole array. And then use it to do our texture frame. So for now, we'll just set those all to 0. Because um, again, we won't be using this quite yet. Um, but eventually... It'll be there when you need it. Um, okay, so now um, I'm gonna define, uh, well, for now I'll just hard code this this one into our constructor here, because we, we do need to pass it a number of frames. Um, and for now we'll just do one. Uh, so this, this should give us exactly the same result as we got before, because um, even though we are using a 3D texture, it's a 3D texture, uh, that is one pixel deep, basically. It's just a single frame. Um, so the result should be exactly the same as a 2D texture, uh, which I guess you could also think about as being one pixel deep. Um, okay, oh, and you can see, I, I forgot to mention this. We're, we're printing out our um, get texture units value here. You can see mine is 32. Um, so I, I recommend you print that out as well. Um, just at, at some point, just so that you know. Um, because that, that can cause problems. And like, if you message me on Discord saying you have problems, that'll, that'll be like one of the first things I ask is how many texture units. Because um, I, I am suspicious of this this hard coding of the value here, which unfortunately you do have to hard code that to some value. Um, but anyways, so that was like pretty underwhelming. Like we did all this work on our texture uh, class. We got it doing uh, these fancy new 3D textures, but it didn't do anything. Um, so let's actually test that very quickly. Uh, so we're going to create another frame in our data array here. Um, I'm going to rearrange this just a bit, uh, just to make it a bit cleaner because it's kind of messy. So we'll have data width, data height, and then data frames. We'll just do two for now. That's all we need to prove that it's working. And then we'll have data frame size is equal to width times height times four, which is the same as what data size was previously because we only had one frame. And then data size is now uh, data frame size times data frames. So the size of each frame times the number of frames. Um, and that will be the total size that we need, that we need in our array. Um, yeah, so now uh, we could sort of do this loop a bit differently and because now we're operating on like a, a bigger uchar array, but I think I'll just keep it simple and just apply more of an offset. Um, where when we're operating on our second frame, um, we want data frame size. 
um, I guess that should be times i. So the, the number of frames that we've already drawn to. Uh, not, not times i, no. So the size of a single frame plus um, the same offset as before. So this will set the red and alpha components in our first frame for every pixel to be 255. And this will set the red and alpha components in our second frame um, to be 255. Um, now let's make that a bit more interesting just so we can tell the difference between the two frames. I'm going to change this to modify the green instead by doing plus one there instead of plus zero. Um, and that's all we need to have two different frames. So all we need now, that's all the data we need. All we need to do now is um, set our texture thing. That should be now taking in data frames, um, which is two. And then I'm just gonna, I'm going to remove all this offset stuff. We don't need it. It's getting annoying. Um, but we will do uh, sort of a time-based update thing here. Um, so we'll store outside of our loop the last time, and then the frame that we're currently on. Uh, and that frame can be a uint, actually. There we go. Uh, maybe not, because we have to send it as an int. Um, OK, so our, our our last time will be like the time at which the last, the previous frame executed. Um, but within each frame, we need to get the time at which the current frame is executing. And we get that with glfw get time. So this returns a double, um, which is just like the number of seconds that have passed. Um, eventually, we'll be taking this and converting it to milliseconds just because it's, I don't know, like computers generally like you, you can specify things down to millisecond accuracy. And so it's good to just have that defaulted. And then we'll do if our time minus our last time is greater than one. So if uh, more than one second has elapsed since our, our last time was set, then we will set samplers at zero. Um, important, actually, now that we're still using this, come up here, uh, just cut this delete samplers from the bottom of this, like, um, chunk up here where we're setting the texture frames and everything, um, and just put it down at the bottom here. So we'll set samplers at zero because we're only using one texture equal to our int frame up here. And then we will increment frame uh, with this nifty little expression here, which just um, increments it. And if it goes over the number of frames, then it loops back to zero automatically. So this will be the value that's set next time this code runs. So it'll continually swap between frames. And then we will do, uh, we need to actually upload this to our shader. So we'll do set uniform one IV on texture frames. Length is texture units and our array is samplers. And then we set last time equal to time. Um, so last time, I think I'll change that to update time. That's a bit, it's a better name. Um, okay, so that should be all we need to do, because uh, in our shader, um, we're already using these texture frame like values. Whatever's here, uh, we're specifying that as the Z coordinate in our VEC3 here, texture frames at index. Um, so when we change that to one or a frame, um, it should automatically be reflected in the output. Oh, I got this annoying error window there. But here we go. We have a rectangle now switching between red and green each frame, which is nice. And of course, if you wanted to add more frames, you could do that pretty easily just by um, extending this up here, setting data frames equal to three and doing some more stuff in the loop. But we don't need to do that. I think I've proved it for now. Um, so I want to see actually when when we're looking at, yeah, so I, we'll probably get to, mm, I don't know, I, I think we'll get just up to the point today of where we'll be loading from um, bitmaps, and then next time on, on uh, sun, uh, Saturday, we'll actually start loading from bitmaps. 
Um, so I, I misjudged that a bit. Um, but we do have sort of a victory here and that we are now uh, done in quotes with our graphics library. This is like um, a very good start. Uh, we will come back and you know modify it. Uh, of course, as I've said, we're gonna keep coming back and adding stuff to the render. Um, we will add uh, another class eventually, a whole other class, a different, a new type of buffer uh, when we do lighting. Um, but this is like it. Um, like we've wrapped up basically all of the OpenGL functionality that we need um, for some 2D games. Um, so what we're going to do now, um, and I, I mentioned this in like the sort of roadmap um, presentation. Let me see if I can find that real quick. Um, before you move on, like, can you go to shader.h really quick? I need to, I didn't get the code for the set uniform 1v and my compiler is freaking out. Um, okay. It's, is it? Yeah, I can see it. Yeah. yeah. So this is like the reason that we, um, created this generic function down here is that you can basically just copy and paste this using the same syntax. You give the function pointer, the name of the uniform, and then all the arguments. Um, so you may have just put those in the wrong order or something. Um, okay. But yeah, anyways, I, I can't find it, but I, I mentioned at the very beginning that like after we write our graphics library, we will be wrapping that again <laughs> in an engine library. Um, now this seems kind of dumb. Uh, and weird, because like we've already sort of accomplished our goal, our initial goal of getting it so that in our, our main function here, we don't have to write a single line of OpenGL code to do what we need to do. Um, and that's good. Like, like you could take what we have now and just sort of run with it and make a game. Um, but this is a, a point where like I, I'd like to... Um, like illustrate the distinction between what we're doing and like actually writing a game engine. Um, this is a great start. And what we've done is like, not like fake by any means. It's definitely a, a necessary component of a real game engine um, for, for graphics, but it's just one of those components. If you're doing like a real hardcore game engine, um, you wouldn't, honestly, you probably wouldn't be using OpenGL at all. Um, but you would definitely be supporting multiple graphics libraries, um, probably DirectX for Windows, um, for everything else. Um, well, for iOS, I think you use something called Metal. I'm not sure what that is. Um, but then for everything else, you'd use Vulkan, which is like maintained by the same people that do OpenGL. Um, it's much lower level, um, but strangely also much more modern and, and uh, I, I would assume faster. Um, so the reason we're now wrapping this in an engine library is because this graphics library is not general purpose. Um, it, it is exclusively an OpenGL implementation of a graphics library. And so our engine library is basically gonna act as an interface between the programmer who's using our engine and whatever graphics library that they have selected to be used or that is required to be used for whichever platform they're building for. Um, so like, um, we'll, we'll have sort of classes that wrap this functionality and then, uh, and again, we're not going to be doing this. We're only doing OpenGL, but if you were doing a real game engine and you were supporting multiple graphics APIs, um, you would, this, this extra layer of abstraction would be necessary, um, because within like the implementation of these, um, the, the implementation of these graphics libraries is going to be different for every API, but we do need a common uh, interface for our user to use. And so that's what the point of an engine library is. Um, even though for our purposes, it, it may seem like overkill and it, 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 I don't know that it is like, it's definitely not, um, super necessary. Like I said, you could probably take what we have here and just sort of run with it. Um, but I think I've put enough like useful functionality into it that it won't just be, um, rewriting a lot of this or, or, or just wrapping a lot of this directly. Um, so that's why we're doing it. Um, even though it, it may seem kind of boring, but hopefully it won't be. So I'm just going to go ahead and uh, quickly close all of our graphics library stuff here. We're done with that for now. Um, I'm going to look at this core file, uh, which I added in the GitHub commit, if you got that. 
Um, so yeah, we in, in our sort of core file for graphics library, we have this OpenGL instance struct. Um, and we're going to have a similar thing in our in our engine, which will just be, I'll just call it engine instance. Um, and then for now, we'll just hard code OpenGL instance GL in there. Um, this this is like the first example of one of those things I was talking about that would be uh, platform dependent. Um, really, we we should wrap this OpenGL instance even further um, in like a, a proper like graphics instance like struct in our engine here. Um, and this would be like GFX graphics instance. Uh, it would be a pointer because you need um, polymorphism, um, whatever. And and then in like our constructor or whatever, or, or you would set this, um, you, you would have like compiler stuff saying, like if I'm building for uh, Windows, uh, yeah, instance would be a new graphics open GL instance and then pass whatever you need in there um, and then else um, I, I don't know how you do el else if but like else else if def whatever that would be um, platform um, Linux uh, you would do GFX graphics instance equals new um, GFX like Vulkan instance, like this. Um, and, and these would share a common interface, so they have all the same functions and we can use them the same, but under the hood, depending on which platform we're building for, they do something different. Um, and really these would these would probably be in, in separate namespaces anyways. That would be in Vulkan and this would be in like OpenGL. Um, but again, we're not actually gonna be doing that. I just thought it would be valuable for you to know that that's like, the reason we're doing this, and that's how it would be used. Um, so we'll just have this is running function, uh, which is, I know I said we're not going to be just directly wrapping a bunch of stuff, but here we are directly wrapping it. Um, and we'll have a similar sort of init and end function that just return an engine instance. Uh, and for now, it's just going to be like, like a pass through thing. We'll have a width height title of our window, window options, and we will return GFX in it, just passing in all of that stuff. Like that. So just th this function will return an OpenGL instance, and then we just create an engine instance with that and return And we'll have an end, which we'll just call GFX end on our OpenGL instance. Okay, um, so now that we have this, let's actually, before we forget, let's actually use this. Um, so before our goal was like to make it so that we didn't have to write any OpenGL code in our main file. Now our goal should be we don't have to write any GFX code, any of our graphics library. We don't have to use that directly. It'll all be abstracted behind the second sort of layer of renderer classes. Um, and a good start for that is our engine instance. I'll just call it engine. Uh, we call init with exactly the same parameters. Um, so not much is changing uh, except the name. So while engine dot is running, and then we want to render dot render on engine dot gl, and then we won't be calling gfx end, just be calling regular end on our engine. Um, so just everywhere you had gl, just replace it with engine. Now when we run this, it should give us exactly the same thing. Perfect. Um, so that's sort of our new goal is is just like maintain the exact functionality we have here, just wrap it uh, a bit further in, and add some more functionality as well. Um, so as I said, unfortunately, I, I don't think we're going to get to the um, like loading from file this time. We're, we're definitely not going to, um, but we can sort of prepare for that. Um, so within our uh, engine here, within our source folder, um, I'll make a new folder called IO. 
Um, and this will contain some just useful classes that we need um, for reading from files. So the first one I'll have be a new item, just a header file called file.h. Um, and now that we are in our engine, we want to include our PCH in every file. Um, it's not necessary in headers. I still like to do it just because it gives you everything um, that you need pretty much, um, but it is actually required. Like this has to be the first line of every C++ file within our source folder here, because that's how we've set up our project. And then we're not doing namespace GFX anymore. We're doing namespace engine. So this will be a template class, um, not of a type, just of an open mode. Um, and this is something that you pass to a, a standard input file stream, IF stream, uh, when you open it to tell it like how to read that file, basically. Um, so this will just be an interface, more or less. Um, so we're going to make it all protected, so you can't create one directly. Obviously, we want our file, M file. Then we'll just have a simple constructor that takes in a file path, opens our, the file at that file path with the given mode, and then we can check if it's open. So if it's not open, um, we'll just like say, error opening this file. like that. Uh, I'll go ahead and delete the copy and move constructors. And then in our destructor, we will close our file. So we're just going to have one method in here for now, which returns an unsigned char called next. And this is just going to get the next character, the next single byte from our file. Um, now, there is the risk of our user like reading the file past the end of the file. Um, well, it's not a risk, I guess, like C++ won't allow that. This IF stream protects against that. Um, but we should definitely print an error if that happens, because probably there's some logical problem going on and the user should know about it. So end of file reached. Um, and you might want to store the file path like as part of the thing and then just print the file path here if you want, but I don't know. I don't care. So we just return zero in that case. Otherwise, we'll do mfile.read a single character into our char. Um, now, we have an interesting thing here where we're trying to return a u char because um, it's it's all text. Like it doesn't it's not signed. It shouldn't be a char. It should be an unsigned char, eight bits. Um, but this mfile.read function takes in a char. Um, if I compile this, I'll go ahead and include it in my main file. You don't have to do this. I'm just showing you. Oh, it works. I don't know. Maybe it's because we're not using it, um, or maybe I just did this because I, I th this may have been something that I had to change uh, to get it to work on Mac, um, and it, it works fine on Windows, as was often the case. Um, but this should be a char. This this read function, you can see here the, the function header is, it takes a char pointer. Um, and when, when you're dealing stuff uh, this low level, just reading single bytes from a file, um, it is important that you don't mess that up because the compiler will perform implicit conversion on between characters and unsigned characters, um, and that can mess up your data. So we said we should pass this method what it expects, which is a char pointer. Um, and this like return like this could be fine. Um, I'm not sure if it would like yell at you, or it might give you a warning. The compiler just might give you a warning saying, hey, you're returning a character. You're trying to return an unsigned character. Don't do that. Um, so we're going to use our pun macro from our math library, which we haven't used yet, I don't think, um, to just cast this, essentially cast it to an unsigned charm. Um, and the reason for this is that we don't want any conversion to happen. If, if we were to just write return buff, um, and this is probably a compiler-dependent thing. Um, 
this it'll see this character and say, okay, I have a character type. I'm returning an unsigned character. It might do some. It might mess with that value. But when we do this punning thing, um, I'll just sort of expand that for you so you can see what it is. You can see so uchar uh, r return is equal to this. So we're taking a pointer to our character here, casting it to a uchar pointer, which doesn't do any conversion because it's just a pointer, and then dereferencing that. So all this does is it takes the memory of this and reads it as a uchar, essentially, which is exactly what we want to do. Uh, we don't want any conversion to happen. Um, so that's why we're using pun there, uh, which I think is neat. OK, and now we'll actually create like uh, a usable version of this interface. I'll call it inputfile.h. So we will include file.h. And then this will extend file class. And we need to give it an open mode. Um, so we want it to read it. So that's going to be standard iOS in. Um, this might not be necessary because we're already using an input file stream, an IF stream. Um, but I just put that there just in case, just to make it clear. Um, and the other flag we're going to give it is standard iOS binary because uh, we want to read it one character at a time. OK. So we just need a pass through constructor here. I will delete the copy and move, of course. Um, and now we can sort of build on this next functionality that we have that just gets one byte um, and get as many bytes as we want. So I'm going to define like existing like functions for, for common sizes, but then we'll also have a general purpose one that can read an arbitrary amount of bytes. Um, so the first one is just going to be byte, which we'll just return next. Second one will be u short, short. Um, so we want to read two consecutive bytes from our file, which have to be read separately. Um, and convert them into a single u short value. Um, now I, I don't know like how much they like teach this sort of like bitwise stuff in in classes, but uh, I'm really into it. I think it's interesting. And this is just simple stuff saying take my 8-bit value here of my first call, shift it left by 8 bits, um, so that it's like the first 8 bits of a short, and then or that bitwise or. So just take the next eight bytes and stick that in the lower eight bits of my short. That's all this says. Um, and then we'll do this for int and long as well. Calling short shifted by 16, because an int is 32. And then long is 64, so we take an int shifted by 32 and or it with another int. Okay, and then we'll have avoid read. Oh, and this might yell at you. Um, left, sh left shift count is negative or greater than or equal to the operand size. Um, so it sees that int returns a uint here, um, and it's shifting left by 32, which is the size of a uint, so that will result in zero. Um, so what we really should be doing here is casting our first call here to a u long. So just take this 32-bit value, copy it into a 64-bit space, and then shift it by 32. Um, but I, I'm not sure why it doesn't like yell at you for the rest of these. Um, I, I guess it would probably be correct to go ahead and add this to the rest of them. Um, but it's never caused any problems for me. It might just be that for whatever reason, Smaller types are implicitly convertible to int, but int is not complicitly convertible to long. I, I don't know. But we can go ahead and add that just, just for peace of mind. Make sure we don't get any overflows there. Uh, so this read method will just take, take in a buffer to write to, and then the number of bytes that we want to write into that buffer. Uh, 
Uh, and we'll just use this uh, ifstream.read function here, uh, which we already used to get a single thing, uh, but there we just specified the length explicitly as one. Um, here we're specifying, or not length, but count as whatever the user says. Um, and then we are requiring that they take in a uchar, because again, for all of our needs, like that's what it should be. It's just a binary file. There should be no sign, no negative numbers or anything. Um, and but but once again, read expects a char pointer, so we'll just we'll just pun that to a char pointer just to make sure nothing happens. Um, and that is probably not necessary actually. I think we could just cast that, but whatever. Okay, so that's our input file, um, and this is going to be used to read our bitmap files because a bitmap is uh, just a essentially list of bytes that are color values. Um, so we'll be calling this byte function um, to get R and then G and then B uh, until we reach the end of our file. Um, so I don't think we'll get, again, we'll not get to reading that today, um, but we can do some basic setup. So I'll define yet another folder here uh, within my source folder. I called it graphics, and I actually spelled it out just to differentiate it between this GFX like library folder up here and then our wrapper in here. So we're going to add a new file called sprite. And this is just going to be like our engine's sort of texture unit, I guess, where in our graphics library, we have the actual texture class. Um, but our engine is going to have this sprite class as its thing. And it it has it's it's essentially like a specialization of the texture class, um, where for our purposes, like we're just going to always set the um, blending function to geo nearest just because I think linear looks terrible um, and stuff like that. And we, we can automatically handle like um, loading the file stuff here. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute, actually, because that's important. So we have this class sprite. Um, I'm going to define some constants here that we'll use next time. Uh, these are just things we need when reading. We don't need them, but it's nicer to define them as constants instead of just leaving these random values um, in your code. So this, these are things we'll need uh, when we're reading from our files because bitmap file types have a certain layout and we need to know where stuff is in order to get the values we want. Okay, now we'll define some actual values are the width and height of our sprite, the number of frames, the frame we are currently on, and the amount of time required to switch to the next frame. And then we will also store, I'll store this as a float, our last frame switch, so the time at which the, the current frame started being displayed. And then we will store a texture pointer called texture, mtexture. And then in our uh, public stuff here, we'll have constructor, take in a file path, number of frames, and the time per frame. Delete this copy constructor and move. And we'll have a destructor here that deletes our texture because that will be dynamically allocated. Uh, so we'll have some getters here. We want to get our texture pointer, get the current frame, get the dimensions, get width, And I'll just copy that and get height. Uh, and then we'll have a method here called update, which will take in a float time. Um, so this is where that uh, frame switching will happen if it's necessary. Um, so in our 
uh, graphics library. We did everything in header files, um, but when you actually like really uh, like we probably should have done this, some of this in different C++ files, um, but for the purposes of writing a, a library that you can just drag and drop into any project, um, it's much easier to use if it's all header files. It's like called a header only library. Um, but when we get into our engine stuff, that's no longer a requirement. Um, and also it'll just help us like avoid circular dependencies if we um, go ahead and define most of the functionality of our classes in C++ files, c.cpp. Um, so like you can see here, we have like the basic getters and stuff. Um, that's not a problem because uh, all the GFX library stuff is included in our PCH, which we have here. Um, and this stuff is just returning uint, so there's no problem. Um, but like for more complex stuff, like for longer functions, I'll generally move those into the C++ file just because it keeps it cleaner. Um, but also eventually we'll get to a point where we have like classes that reference each other um, and you can't include, like you can't include file A in file B and also include file B in file A. That like, that's a circular dependency. There's, it's an infinite loop for the compiler. Um, so you have to use some tricks to avoid that. And part of it is actually defining stuff in a C++ file. So the first step of any C++ file is to include pch.h. Then we will include our header and we're good to go. Uh, I'll just copy this. Um, okay. So we can probably write the update function actually, cause that's really simple. Uh, we just have, if m frames is greater than one. So if, if our texture actually has multiple frames, um, if, if it's only one frame, we don't want to update it. We don't want to spend that time. There's no point. So if we have multiple frames and the given time minus the last time, oops, the last time that we switched frames is greater than or equal to time per frame, the amount of time required to switch frames, then we will update our last frame switch to the current time and increment our current frame using that same handy expression that just loops back to zero uh, when it um, becomes an invalid index, essentially. Um, so that's our update. Uh, all the important work, though, is going to happen in this sprite constructor, which we'll have to write next time. Um, and, but this is an important point that I want to make um, and, and like a, a real reason for why we are further abstracting our graphics library now into an engine library is our texture class just takes in data. It takes an array of data and obviously some descriptions about what that data is. Um, and that's correct. Like th that's the right way to do this. That's all it should take in. Um, a, a more naive approach would be to have this instead take in a file path and read the bitmap itself. Um, but that's not very general purpose. Um, like, you know, for our cases, we're only reading bitmaps, so we, we could get away with that. Um, but as a general purpose graphics library, um, your texture needs to be able to like handle whatever you throw at it basically. And we've set that up for the most part by, by allowing the user to set all these texture options. And so just giving it a file path and saying, oh no, you can only use bitmaps. That would just sort of, you know, derail the whole thing. Um, so that's that's like why we're doing this, um, especially for the sprite. It's, it's, it's especially important to have that distinction between this is the thing that receives data and like actually stores it on the GPU this is the thing that gets that data. My engine is responsible like for the, the format of the data, how I want to read it from disk or you know, generate it, I guess, if you want. And all my graphics library is responsible for is sending that to OpenGL um, in whatever format I give it, and I can specify the format. Um, so that's, I think, a very important, um, but it's, it's like a good example of uh, the, the point, I guess, of abstracting this out further. Um, but yeah, I'll stop rambling. Um, next time we will actually fill out this constructor and read from um, some bitmaps, which will be cool. Um, that's like a pretty big step. 
and then we will just continue on um, like further abstracting this graphic stuff into an engine library. Um, let me see if there's anything notable particularly that we'll be doing next time. Um, so we'll be writing an, in, uh, an engine renderer, so like a renderer class in our engine here, which will wrap this renderer and keep track of uh, some additional stuff like time for us, um, which will be handy. Um, but yeah, th there's not too much that we're actually wrapping um, from our graphics library. It's, it's honestly mainly just the texture. Um, but uh, I, don't th I don't think we'll get through all that next time. Um, but it, it's pretty short, so probably next time, so probably by uh, next next Wednesday, we'll be done with all of our graphics stuff, like all of our basic graphics stuff, and then we'll move on to uh, getting user input, which is also pretty short, um, just so that we can control stuff happening on the screen with our keyboard. Um, and then we'll get into, like, the, the more, what, what I think are the more, I mean, graphics programming is very interesting, obviously, um, but what I think is, like, um, a lot of graphics programming is just sort of boilerplate stuff, like not that much of it is cool shader stuff. Um, so I think something that I'm more interested in is like the high level architecture of stuff. Um, and once we get these sort of basic components put into our engine, um, we'll get to do that. So we'll work on uh, map data, which is neat, lighting, a dynamic system, um, adding hitboxes so stuff doesn't pass through each other. Um, and then finally our scripting language, uh, just to sort of reiterate the roadmap there. Uh, but yeah, anyways, more on this next time. Um, thanks for coming, and I will see you on Sunday. No, Saturday. I don't know why I'm saying Sunday. On Saturday at 4 p.m.